Alright, hey guys, and welcome to the first online lecture for the business apprenticeship. And today we're going to be talking about productivity. And to talk about productivity, we need to talk about economics. So I know a couple of you were saying that you thought that it would be interesting to learn economics when we talked about what you wanted to learn about in office hours. So here you go, day one going right into it but um anyway so the basis of economics is on relies upon supply and demand now what is supply and demand you might be wondering well got it right here so demand people wanting to buy goods or services at a given price so goods or services what Goods and services are essentially products, like what people make or what people sell. Um, and so demand is if I have a Snickers bar, the demand is how many people want it and how much you're willing to pay for it. So, um, or the demand is rather a better example is if I have that Snickers bar and I set a price for it, let's say I set it at 50 cents, how many people are going to want that Snickers bar for 50 cents? That is what, how many people are going to demand that Snickers bar at 50 cents? That's demand right there. And then supply is how much of a product is produced for sale. So if there's only one Snickers bar, then that's the supply. And the demand is how many people are willing to buy it at the price that I set for it. So that's a quick overview of what supply and demand are. And those are going to be really important because those are the, the basis of economics. And each one of those two, supply and demand, have what they call a law. So there's the law of demand and the law of supply. And we can graph the law of demand and the law of supply on an xy axis with price right here being the y or yeah the y axis and quantity being the x axis so the reason why it's price and quantity is just what i was saying when i said price um when we talk about demand it's at what price are willing to people buy it so if i set it at 50 cents how many people will demand it there's the price and if there's only one of them that's the supply right there so um that's the reason why we use price and quantity to determine it. So, with the law of demand, the law of demand is pretty much just a fancy name for saying that the demand curve goes down. Like that. It is a downward sloping curve. And the reason is, the higher we go with price, the less people are going to want to buy it. So, if I have a Snickers bar, and I make you pay five bucks for it, Less people are going to want to buy it than if I sell it for 50 cents. Then if I sell it, well, that's not really on the graph there. But if I sell it for 50 cents right there, then more people are going to want to buy my Snickers bar than if I sold it up here for five bucks. Right? And that works anywhere along the price line. Any, the lower you make the price, the more people are going to want to buy my Snickers bar. So that's why demand is downward sloping. Now, on to supply. The law of supply is pretty much the opposite of the law of demand. Because if you noticed, when I talked about the law of demand here, the people who were demanding, who who made the curve downward sloping were the customers. So when I said that people will buy less of it if it goes down here, or if it if the price is higher, and people will buy more of it if the price is lower, those are the people who are driving demand, right? The people are going to buy more if the price is lower. The people are going to buy less if the price is higher. Now supply supply obviously is with the people who are supplying the product so 
with them, they are the reverse of the people who want to buy. They want to make as much money as possible. These people want to pay as little as possible for a good or, good or service. These people want to make as much as possible. Right? So, if the price for a Snickers bar is down here, then I'm going to want to make less Snickers bars because there is less profit in there for me. I only get 50 cents for making Snickers bars and selling them. But if a Snickers bar can be sold for five bucks, then that is so much more profit for me. So I am going to make so many more Snickers bars if people are willing to buy them at five dollars. So the problem here is pretty clear, right? These people over here want to to buy for as little as possible. And these people over here want to sell for as much as possible. And that's that's a problem because they're competing interests, right? They're, they, they're going to have to agree somewhere where they both will buy and sell at the same price. And that's where we get the supply and demand curves intersecting. So what we can do with both of our graphs here is we can put the supply curve and the demand curve together. So here's the demand curve, of course. And over here is the supply curve. And where they meet, Oops. Where they meet, that spot in the middle, that is called market equilibrium. And pretty much what market equilibrium means is that, like on a scale, everything is balanced. So the reason why it's called market equilibrium is because the amount that people are willing to pay and the demand right here is equal to the amount that people are willing to sell it for. So even though this person in supply would like to sell it for as much as they can, they're willing to sell it right here because it makes a fair amount of profit for them. And even though these people over here in the demand want to buy it for as little as possible, they intersect right here and they're willing to buy that much for it so to make a fair trade and that's pretty much the same idea as if you were to come up to me and there were three snickers bars and i was selling them for you know two bucks each and you weren't willing to buy it at two bucks each and so I had to lower my price because nobody was buying my Snickers bars. So I had to lower it to a buck fifty. And even though that's not the price that you'd want it to be at, you'd want it to be cheaper, you're willing to pay for it there. If you're not willing to pay for it there, I have to keep lowering it. But I want to get as much as I possibly can. So the point that we agree on right here, that is market equilibrium. And this is driven by needs and wants. So a need, obviously, is something that is a necessity. A want is something that is driven by culture or driven by personal uh, character. But both of them drive people to buy. And so when you when you need or you want something, you are willing to make a sacrifice of your money for it. And it's just, the question is, how much you are willing to sacrifice? And where is that market equilibrium? All right, so that is the basis for productivity. And now we're going to show you how economics here plays into productivity on a governmental scale. So. When the market is left alone, 
That is what we call efficiency. Because when people are buying and selling at the same price that they can agree on, that's good. But when people try and start to mess with the market, we get inefficiency. So um, we'll call this section market controls. All right. So let me make a new graph here. All right. Oops. There's your demand curve. There's your supply curve. And there is market equilibrium. All right? And over here is price. And over here is quantity. All right. So let's take an example. Let's take a problem that is known as price controls. All right. So what are price controls? Well, price controls. Actually, let's start off with uh, the minimum wage because that, that's easier for you guys to understand. Price controls we'll do as a second example because it's a little more uh, a little more explaining to do. All right, so let's say the minimum wage. Without a minimum wage, the suppliers right here, the suppliers are the people who are offering jobs. They are supplying jobs. So if the suppliers are offering something in this situation, it's jobs. The people who demand it down here are the workers. Oops, my bad. I switched it up really quick. Um, messed that up. Uh, so instead, the suppliers, the supply is labor. The demand is jobs. There we go. All right. So the demand is people want jobs, right? Uh, people want workers to come and work at their store. So let's take, for example, McDonald's, right? Oh, that didn't come out exactly the way I wanted to. Let's take McDonald's. McDonald's is running a business and they need people to run that business for them. If they only have, you know, three workers, then they can only produce that amount. If they have 15 workers, it can produce far more. And how many workers they need is based on how well the McDonald's is doing, how much money they're making. So if they need more people and there's more demand for this McDonald's, they'll need more workers, right? So the more uh, the McDonald's wants workers, they want people to take jobs. I should probably just label that. Um, so the, the the supply is labor, the demand is workers. Um, that's probably a better way of phrasing it. Uh, gotta think, there's gonna be a lot of people confused. <laughs> so office hours are gonna be fun. Make sure to go to office hours, everyone. Um, anyway, so the the demand is workers. The McDonald's wants workers. The supply is labor. You are looking for a job. And you are offering your skills and your time to McDonald's. You want to make as much of a salary as possible. McDonald's wants to pay you as little as possible so that they can save money and make a profit. The point that which the point which you and McDonald's can agree on that you will take the job because you think that it's they are paying you well and fairly 
for the amount of time that you're putting in and the amount of effort that you have in your labor is equal to the amount that they are willing to pay you in the current market. Because obviously, labor is more or less valuable depending on how much people can afford it. So the McDonald's is going to agree with you on what they think is a fair price. Now, let's say with the minimum wage, everybody knows the minimum wage is the idea that you can't pay somebody lower than a specific price. Let's say it's $15 an hour. The problem is, let me move this, whoops, let me move this price really quick. Um, might as well move the quantity as well. Um, so the problem is, if McDonald's was willing to pay you, let's say, $11 an hour, that's below what the minimum wage is. So there's going to be problems there. But let's say at $11 an hour, they want to hire eight people, right? Now, the minimum wage comes in, and let's make this, um, you know what, let's get funky. Let's make this like a weird, flamey thing. All right, minimum wage comes in, right? And boom. They price it on up to $15 an hour. Now, nobody can be paid below 15 an hour. That's what I get for going funky. Now, it's kind of hard to see. Anyway, um, so nobody can get paid below $15 an hour. Now, if you can spot the problem here, now, if we cut all of this out, anything below that bar, what happens, these two points aren't intersecting. And if you remember, when they intersect, that means that the person demanding and the person supplying are in agreement. So if they can't intersect, then there's less agreement, right? So, and when there is disagreement, the laborer does not win. The person who is the supply here, they do not win because it's this person who is providing the jobs. So they can only provide as much jobs as they can afford, right? So if there's a minimum wage, the company has to pay people at $15 an hour, which means they're going to hire less people because they can't afford it. So if they're going to hire at a lower wage, if they're going to hire more people, if they're going to hire eight people, then maybe at a minimum wage of 15, they're only going to hire four people. And that changes the higher the minimum wage is. And we call this, this gap right here, inefficiency. Because it is not the most efficient way that people will make agreements. The market wants more people hired. The market wants eight people hired. But with the minimum wage law, the minimum wage says, no, we, you have to pay this much. And as a consequence, only four people are going to be hired. Now, let's take another example because that might be a wee bit confusing. Um, if it's not confusing, then that's great. Um, this example is just going to clarify another way of looking at it. But anyway, here we go. Oh, one last idea. This gap right here, this gap between what the market wants and what people are willing to pay, that is lost jobs, that gap in between those two.